Welcome to the Engage series. This is four simple short videos to help all of us engage with God, engage with his word, engage with his church and engage in his mission. Uh, these videos are for a time uh, in a season where the church doors have had to be shut and people have had to spend time in isolation. Our heart behind this series is that we might help you continue to engage in who God is and what his plan is for your life and his church. We hope this series is a blessing. We hope it will strengthen you in a difficult season and we hope that it will strengthen your church as a whole. Hi, my name's Pat. I'm the youth pastor at St. Paul's Castle Hill in Sydney and I'm excited to bring you the first of this Engage series. Uh, the aim of this message is to help us think about how we engage with the church now that the doors are shut and we can't meet face to face for six months or maybe even longer. We're going to look at uh, big questions like, well, what is the church and how does that affect what we're going to do day to day now? And let's start with that question. What is the church? And there's, there's a problem even in the wording of that. It's the problem with the word what. See, if the church is a, is a service, if it's a meeting or a group of activities, it's a style or a function or a certain building in which people gather, if that's what makes church, church, then it's really apparent that the church is fragile and something like what we're facing now does damage to the church and stops the church. It also means if church is a service or a group of activities or a style of meeting or about a building or the right people, then the church isn't really achievable on a global scale. So to ask what is the church is a problem in itself. I think a better question to set us up as we look at a whole, a whole long stretch of time where we're going to be in isolation is who is the church? We need to ask the question, who is the church? See, the word that we translate to be church is ecclesia, which is actually the word for gather or gathering. And that makes it really easy to think, well, if that's the word, then the church means to gather, to come together. Church is that thing that happens on Sunday when all the right people are in the room doing the right thing. But the idea of this word gather isn't so much an idea of a whole bunch of bodies coming together in a physical place. It's an idea of us being gathered in the salvation of Jesus Christ. The idea of gathering or the church being the gathered, it means the church are the people who come together under the name, under the lordship, under the kingship of Jesus and who he is. Not so much about a time or a place, not so much about a service or a system of meeting. The church can be gathered together in the name of Jesus across many nations at all times. And when you start to think of that as your model for church, it's a people that are come, coming together under Jesus. All of a sudden, the church becomes powerful. The church becomes unbreakable because the church is global and the church is dynamic and the church doesn't start and end on a Sunday morning. The church is at all times wherever God's people are, wherever there are people who serve our Lord Jesus. It's not so much a time, a place, or a gathering, it's those people who say, Jesus is my Lord. And what that means is as we reflect on church, Jesus is actually the center of the church. And it makes sense out of Ephesians 1, which talks about the body of Christ and, and Christ being the head of that body. The church revolves completely around Christ and the global church is all those who follow Christ. This means... If you are a Christian, you have not been saved in order to attend church. You have been saved in order to be the church. That sets us up to look into uh, the, this season that we're facing where the coronavirus has forced us into isolation. If we are the church, if the people who say, I follow Jesus, I love Jesus, are the church, well, how do we be the church in a season where we can't come together and we can't share fellowship, we can't meet over meals, we can't do communion and everything like that? Well, what I want to do is have a look at the function of the church, the function of the people of God and see how that applies to us in this season of isolation. 
The church has many various aspects to it and there's a whole bunch of different things that the church does and the church is dynamic and the Bible calls us to so many different things. Uh, but I want to sum it up with kind of three really simple things. The church is about focusing up, focusing across and focusing out. Let's start at looking, fo- looking at focusing up from 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I love that this is based around being a people. And we're being a people that are called to do something. We are called to declare the praises of him who drew us out of darkness into his wonderful light. We are called to be a royal priesthood, that is people about the work and the church of God, a holy nation, people whose very character reflects the character of their God, God's special possession, the people he loves and cares for. As we do church or as we are church to use better language we are to glorify God and also reflect him in two ways we need to be focused up towards God the 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 model and the mode and the calling of the church is to bring glory and praise and honor and thankfulness to our God because of the salvation we have in him because of who he is we need to praise God and be thankful to God and engage with God And we also need to learn to reflect God and be holy as he is holy. So the first function of the church, the people of Jesus, is to look up, to praise God, to bring him glory and also bring him glory by reflecting him in who we are, by going through the process of sanctification. It's eyes on God that cause us to give him glory and cause us to reflect him for his glory. Now, the church isn't just one dimensional. It's not just this upward focus. The church is a people and it's, it is a people who are united in what Jesus has done. So if you jump to a passage like Colossians 3, we start to see the across aspect of what the church is called to do. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. As you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. Now, what I want us to notice here is that there is a whole bunch of upward focused movements in this. You have the peace of Christ ruling in your heart. We're singing to God. We're doing it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we're giving thanks again to God. God, but it's as this upward focus on our God happens, as the church, the people of Jesus focus on their God in praise and reflecting him, that the across happens at the same time. As you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit. What we're doing in our praise for God is also meant to admonish one another. It's meant to encourage and to edify and to build up. So the function of the church is to enjoy God, glorify him, become more like him and bring others along on that same journey. We do this. We give glory and praise to God and we do it in a way that encourages those around us. The way we admonish one another with wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the spirit. We build up the across aspect, the love of each other in the church by focusing together on our God. People love to quote Hebrews 10, 25 to you. If you miss church a few weeks in a row, you might know it. Maybe you've heard it a few too many times. Do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But what we seem to miss a lot as we quote that verse is Hebrews 10, 24, which says this. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. The reason we meet together as a church when we can is so that we might spur one another on. We meet together in order to encourage each other on that journey and that lifetime discipleship of bringing God glory and growing to be more like him. And what God does as uh, God's people kind of come together under him 
bringing him praise and glory and loving each other, is he adds power there. We see that in Matthew 18, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with him. We see the command to love each other and to, to interact with each other in the same way Jesus interacts with us in John 13, 35. A new command I give to you, love one another as I, has lo- as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And then God loves to add his power to the gathered people. We see that in Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered in my name. I am there with them. God is really passionate about the church, the people of Jesus, honoring him and praising him and glorifying him, but also seeing to one another and caring for one another and loving one another. We see that really loud and clear in John 13, 35. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. You can see that upward focus as Jesus has done, so do to each other. By this, everyone will know that you are are my disciples if you love one another. The mark of God's people, the mark of the church, is a love for one another and a glory-giving life to God. As we bring glory to God by praising Him and reflecting Him, we encourage others to do the same. And the largest way I think we can do that, the largest way we can encourage others to run after Jesus is to wholeheartedly, passionately run after him ourselves. If we want someone else to give glory to God, to grow in the way that they reflect him, we should give our whole heart, mind and soul to bringing glory to God and growing in the way that we reflect him, that they may follow us as we follow Christ. The final call we're going to look at on the church is the call to also go out. We must look up to God. We must look across to each other, but we also need to look out into the world God has put us in. We see as Jesus preaches in Matthew 5, he says a city on a hill cannot be hidden. And I love that imagery because the the city isn't just one light. The other parts of of Matthew 5 talk about a lamp, um, but this is talking about a city, a collection of lights together on a hill cannot be hidden. We must be the light of God in a dark world. Acts 1.8 tells us that we receive, the disciples will receive the Spirit and have power to be witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We are called to be a part of that, to be a witness out of the church, out into the world of who God is. We see that that outward movement isn't just simply coming with a message and, and throwing it at people, but it's also reflected in the way we treat people. We see this in Matthew 25 as Jesus kind of separates those gathering in his name into two groups. There's the first group who saw people in need and cared for them and loved them and sought to to solve the problems of their life, to show them the love of Jesus in a practical, tangible way. And the way that Jesus speaks about this is he basically says, what you did for those people, you have done for me. And to the other group who didn't care for those with needs, who didn't look after the people in the world, he says, you didn't care for me. Because Jesus loves all people. He loves the world and desires all to be saved. Jesus' heart is that the church, those who call him Lord, would be a reflection of his love and care. We see that the church isn't meant to be stagnant and still. The call of Romans 10 to evangelize and to send people out into evangelism. The church needs to have a powerful and clear outward focus. We need to see the need to care for the people in this world and to care for them by bringing them the truth of Jesus and the salvation message of his death and his resurrection. So let's sum this up. If the church exists as the people who see Jesus as their Lord, And these people are called uh, to, to look upwards by glorifying God, praising Him and reflecting Him in their life. If we're called to look outward to each other, sideways in the church, to admonish, to encourage and to edify each other. And if we're called to look out into the community to care for the needs of people as if they were Jesus themselves and called to bring the message of salvation to them. Well, then how do we be the church when the doors are closed? How do we do all of these things and be all of these things when we can't meet together face to face? 
Well, friends, this could be seen as something to back down from. This could be seen as a season where we've lost hope and we've lost the ability to do that. We've lost the ability to be the church. But I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you to say maybe the opposite is true. Maybe what is before the church now is an opportunity to step into a season of ministry empowered by the Spirit, led by God, where we can bear more fruit in His power than we have in the seasons gone by where we might see the church more active and more powerfully at work than if we were still able to meet together face to face. Let's think about it. If we need to be focusing up on God, we can still gather in God's word. We are going to have live streams happening from so many different churches. Our church every Sunday at 10 a.m., we can gather together under his word, pray together, hear the Bible read together and reflect on who God is together. Yes, we may not be able to be in arm's reach of each other, but we can reflect on God's word at the same time. We can passionately and purposefully go about ripping out the parts of our life that don't reflect the glory and the holiness of God and producing in ourselves by God's spirit the life that reflects his We can still look across to the other people in our church. We can still call. We can still interact with. We can still encourage. We can still see how they're going. We can edify each other. We can still be in each other's lives. Yes, we may not be able to sit in a room face to face with each other, but we can still make contact. We can still ask questions. We can still pray over people. We can still invest in lives. We can still encourage each other by running after God and drawing others along with us. And now... More than ever, we have an opportunity to reach out. There is a whole world of people with big questions. There is a crisis happening. And during crisis, the church needs to stand up in the stillness and the peace and the rest that we have in Jesus, knowing that he has overcome this world. So no matter what trouble we face, we can have peace. We stand up with that heart and we reach out. Imagine a world where six months from now or 12 months from now, whenever we can gather together again, we see people we've never seen before because we had people, members of the church, all of us inviting friends to do church in our living room, inviting friends to watch some content that different churches around the world are producing, inviting friends to share a meal and to share a gospel message, inviting friends and answering their big questions questions about the chaos and the the panic and the anxiety around the world. We have a God who offers peace. We have a God who offers rest for those who are weary and burdened. We have an opportunity for a world in a world that has never been so aware of its pain, that has never been so aware of its brokenness, that has never been so aware of how weary and burdened it truly is. We have a world that is asking big questions about humanity about the earth itself, about what sort of people exist in this day and age. We have opportunity after opportunity to answer for the hope that we have in Jesus. We could take this time to step back from ministry, to step back from evangelism, to relax and say, well, the doors are closed to our buildings, so we're not really going to be able to do the church anymore. Or we can take this opportunity to run into a season of ministry, a season of evangelism, a season of giving glory to God and growing to be more like him, giving the extra time we have in the day to his word and to learning and into prayer. We can give the extra time we have in the day to loving our brothers and sisters in our church and encouraging them and building them up and making contact with them regularly and consistently. We can make the most of this opportunity because there are clear and evident needs for the church to be going out to meet. We can care for the elderly. We can care for the sick. We can care for the vulnerable. We can care for those who have needs. And we can care for the greater society by being bold enough to say there is a message that brings hope in this hopeless, dark world. Just one last thing I want to say as we wrap up. Um, I want to concede a point that we actually do lose something as we can't gather together face to face. There is a loss there. There is a, a, there is a sense of community. There is a sense of interaction and connection that you only get when you're sitting in a room with someone. And one of the great things we do as we gather for the church and the reason that church is so powerful and so purposeful and so great is because we don't just meet and consume a service and leave. No, we come as the church and we interact together as the church after the service. But I wonder, uh, a question to, to hopefully challenge you, 
Will your Sundays look any different now? Or were you already going to church, consuming some content and leaving? When you come back from this period of time of isolation, uh, will it look different for you than when you're at home? Maybe this is an opportunity for us to sit and reflect and ask ourselves a question. Are we being the church even when the doors are open? Are we being the church even when the opportunity is clear and before us? Maybe this will be a catalyst. Maybe this will be a moment that leads us to be the church, to be glorifying God, growing to be actively more and more like Him, being sanctified in the power of the Spirit, being purposeful and active and loving one another in the church and being passionately driven out of our bubbles, out of our world, into the rest of the world to show them the love of God through action and through the gospel. Yes, we lose something. But God holds the church in his hand and he holds it right now. The church is not a time or a place. The church is the people of God and we will be that forevermore. Uh, Well, we hope this Engage session has been a blessing for you. We want to let you know that tomorrow we'll be releasing our second session. Uh, Emma Sibley will be helping us understand how to engage in God's Word in a dynamic, life-changing way as we live through this season of isolation together. Thank you for listening, and we hope we've been able to bless you.